Hi, everyone, and welcome uh, to the first of Road and Track Experiences Inside Track. And today, we have a guest who really needs no introduction. Uh, Mario Andretti has had the career of three champions. He's won the Indy 500, the Daytona 500, and an F1 World Championship. The only other American to do that was Phil Hill. Um, he has been dominant in racing behind the wheel for five decades, which is astonishing. And he has a long association with road and track. His name is synonymous with speed. He's Mario Andretti. Welcome, Mario. What did you think of, of this period where uh, the simulation has stood in for real racing? I'd say thank goodness for iRacing, you know, because uh, it certainly filled the time uh, beautifully. Uh, I think it's been a surprise for everyone. And uh, you can see that the way the competition was ramping up, I mean, it's, uh, it was getting pretty serious, you know. Um, so again, um, you know, kudos to, uh, to everyone that, uh, you know, tried to make something out of nothing, really. Uh, and um, so, and I can see that actually this iRacing might continue in the off season. Um, I just see that because uh, all this equipment that everyone is uh, arming themselves with, you know, uh, this uh, simulators are becoming the thing of the day. So, um, uh, so again, uh, I think uh, that's a good thing, but um, nothing like the real thing. And we're all chomping at the bit, you know, to just uh, start getting uh, the real thing going. Um, it's, uh, as you said, NASCAR, I think uh, we'll be the first ones uh, to, uh, to, to venture uh, out uh, with the, in Darlington uh, the 17th of this month. So uh, we are looking forward to that and, and Indy will follow suit. Uh, it's planned to be in, uh, in Dallas, I think at the, at the beginning of June. So um, we can't wait. Yeah, it seems like with the Indy 500 in August, moving to August will be a huge moment for IndyCar. Um, but I love that idea of parallel series. Yes, indeed. I mean, it's, uh, let's face it. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, you have to do what you have to do and uh, you have to keep an open mind and be creative. Uh, all of that. Uh, take advantage of the time that's left in the season. Um, and, and again, I think this would be probably uh, some double headers with NASCAR, which is something that had been talked about. And this could be probably the opportunity, you know, to maximize that situation. So, um, you know, I mean, uh, with all the disciplines in a, you know, at the top level, you know, it's, uh, uh, we, we all can, can get together and, and make the best of it and try to, uh, uh, to give the most that we can to the fans. And um, hopefully, uh, I mean, the loyalty, I'm sure will be there. Um, I hope that if they all feel like me, we're, we're, we're good. <laughs> you know, so, uh, Again, it's um, some good things will come out of it. I always felt that every negative is a positive. So um, I think that, um, uh, as you say, we'll start thinking a little bit outside the box and, and maybe experiment with certain things, you know, little tweaks here or there that uh, probably would not have taken place otherwise. So um, again, you know, there's always an opportunity to do something that uh, probably would not have taken place. Speaking of the fans, uh, as a driver at Indy, how much is the crowd a factor? How much do you miss uh, by racing virtually? You know, Eddie, uh, the sport, any sport is show business, you know, and, um, you know, why do they say that uh, a home game uh, is also very important for the home team? Why? Because uh, the crowd is just cheering, uh, you know, the loudest and, uh, uh, the energy is there. You have uh, people that, uh, uh, family, you have friends and you want to show off. Um, in racing, it's the same thing, of course. I mean, it's, uh, for some reason, uh, you like to think, oh yeah, well, the crowd is, uh, uh, you know, we don't think about that, but yes, we do. Um, I remember the very first time at Indianapolis in 65 when I was a rookie and, um, 
in qualifying in those days, you had easy 200,000 people out there. So it's the first time ever in my career that I've gone out on the track on my own. And uh, you always say, well, you know, the crowd is academic. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I have 200, 400,000 eyes looking at me. I better not screw up, you know what I mean? So it was there. And, uh, and again, uh, you just feel like uh, there's just a little extra zip in you to perform, we you know when there's a huge crowd, more responsibility, more ego, all of those things. Yeah, we need we need the we need the spectators, no question about it. So, having raced in really every series, what was your favorite? What was uh, the most enjoyable? Well, uh, my specialty was uh, always uh, single seaters, open wheel. You know, and uh, you can see my main activities have been always that. But uh, uh, did I enjoy venturing off to uh, other disciplines? As I say, you know, even some stock cars and, and uh, sports prototypes, uh, absolutely. Um, I just love the opportunity to race with the top teams uh, and mixing it up with the best drivers uh, of the time. Um, and then, you know, especially uh, if you're lucky enough to win, which, you know, we, you know I did uh, here and there. Um, it gives you, to me, the ultimate satisfaction, quite honestly. Um, and when I look back, uh, I feel that I, I've been so fortunate to have had these opportunities. Uh, um, I wouldn't change a thing, quite honestly, in my life. The only thing I would change is my age. You know, I make myself about 30 years younger so I could do some more racing. You look great. <laughs> <laughs> you look young. So besides, you're speaking of competitors, besides Michael, who is the toughest competitor for you in, well, in any I series? You, I wish I could give you just one, quite honestly, um, Eddie. Uh, over the years, I've been, again, uh, I've been around for so long and, um, uh, you know, the, throughout different decades. And, um, you know, when I broke into, uh, into uh, the top level uh, here in the United States of IndyCars, uh, uh, who were the protagonists? I mean, uh, AJ Foyt was there, you know, he was already champion. Uh, he was five years my senior, so he had that experience. So that's who you shoot for. And, um, you know, my first uh, experience in Formula One, uh, who was the guy that was just basically the standard was Jackie Stewart. I mean, others, of course, you know, Graham Hill and, and, and uh, Chris Amon and, and on and on. I mean, there were many others. But uh, there's always one that's a little bit, you know, of a yardstick, if you will. Um, and, and, and other times, you know, in, uh, even uh, in sports prototypes. I mean, when, when, uh, when Bruce McLaren and I won uh, uh, Sebring, for instance, in 67, you know, with Ford, um, uh, do I cherish the, the, the battle that I had with Phil Hill, who was in the Chaparral? And uh, uh, things like that, you know, you just mentioned Phil Hill. You know, I raced again, so we raced basically wheel to wheel. Um, you know, th these are just incredible moments, you know, when I reflect on it that uh, become even more important. So um, I look at the roster just the other day, um, we did something with the uh, Automotive Hall of Fame and um, uh, who were inducted there. It's amazing. You know, the icons that uh, I've had the opportunity to, uh, uh, to be with, to race against, and also others in the industry that I uh, had conversations with, you know. So um, all of that, uh, you know, means, you know, an awful lot to me. But uh, um, uh, again, uh, the fact that I've been around, you know, so long, uh, you, you know, is something that uh, I uh, take not, I don't take for granted. I always say, count my blessings every day for the opportunities. So what was your mental prep like before going into a big race? What, what was your ritual? Well, the ritual is uh, something very private, but uh, it's, um, uh, it's like anything else. When you are going to enter competition, you, you uh, you, you feel, uh, you know, you hope that you're prepared enough. Uh, it's all about, uh, you know, the more that you know, the more preparation you have, uh, the more relaxed you are. 
And, um, you know, from that standpoint, uh, you try to do uh, as much as possible in that respect. Uh, it's the same thing if you're going to give a speech. You know, if uh, you're really well prepared, you're very relaxed, and, uh, and, and you're going to be eloquent. So uh, anytime uh, you have to perform at the top level, uh, you hope that you're that. And, um, and again, I had to try to uh, uh, maintain a frame of mind that, uh, that's very positive. And, um, and, you know, you always have your butterflies. If you don't have your butterflies, it means it's not important to you. You know, that's healthy. But at the same time, um, you just have to, you have to just feel cool, relax. And uh, because uh, tension and everything else, uh, I think, uh, is, is always dangerous in the sense that uh, uh, sometimes you don't think clearly. Uh, and, uh, you know, and many times uh, you, you do uh, have the situation and, then, uh, and you make some mistakes and then, uh, then you have to reflect on it. Oh, man, let's not screw up again. Let's not do that ever again. So, I mean, it's a, it's a natural thing, you know, but uh, at the same time, it's, you have to be, have very collected, you know, in, in, in your approach. Must have been extraordinarily difficult at a time when racing was so dangerous and open wheel racing, especially uh, well, you lost so many people. Yeah. I mean, uh, let's face it, the, the dark side of our sport were the fatalities, no question. And, um, you know, in the decades that, uh, I was active, uh, you know, the first decades of the sixties and seventies, especially, um, you know, uh, yes, uh, we lost, too many uh, potential uh, future champions, uh, of course. And um, yes, that was the dark side. But uh, at the same time, uh, we, we knew of the risk, but we didn't know any better because uh, we had never seen cars safer. We had never seen tracks safer. So all of that had to happen. And uh, fortunately, um, you know, some of the, uh, the mentality was, even from a driver's standpoint, we had to organize ourselves to push that aspect. Uh, you couldn't do it alone. Um, and uh, our reasoning was simple. You know, uh, we're obviously uh, getting smarter and smarter about the cars we're uh, engineering and making it go faster. Why can we use some of that knowledge to make them safer? And uh, the important thing is that uh, uh, all of the safety aspect, I said this a million times, uh, have to be uh, part of the rule because uh, almost every safety feature is a performance penalty. So it um, has to be, uh, you know, just uh, as part of that, uh, what, uh, you know, the, the rule book will say. And, uh, and, and again, uh, fortunately, the sport has gotten more and more uh, responsible. Uh, let's face it, um, as the sport was becoming more and more commercial, especially, you know, beginning the 80s, I would say, um, the sanctioning bodies uh, had to uh, look at, uh, at this aspect, you know, the safety. Um, I mean, like in Formula One, it started with catch fencing and uh, it was a step forward um, and then trying to uh, contain uh, the, the fires, you know, with, uh, you know, bladders and so on and so forth, uh, uh, having some aircraft uh, fittings and all of those things, uh, breakaways and, and all the features that uh, would contain, um, you know, fuel under an impact. Um, and, and again, it was a slow process, but uh, it was a work in progress, which it is still today. But uh, luckily, Eddie, we've, uh, we're at the level now that um, best ever for the drivers. Uh, uh, I think, um, you know, the beauty about today's drivers, I'll say, and I'm knocking on wood, that uh, the best chance uh, uh, of retiring on their own terms is now. Uh, and that's a beautiful thing for the sport. Yeah. And, you know, and it just speaks loudly for the future. Well, you've been, in Nor you and Jackie Stewart, I think, are, um, two of the people have been enormously influential in making the sport safer while still retaining, obviously, all the excitement of it. So speaking, speaking of cars, do you, do you see racing cars as just tools or is there an emotional aspect to it? I mean, do you have any connection to a favorite car like the Hawk? Or? Well, it's both. 
you know, it's emotional, of course, you know, there's a lot of that and, uh, and it's a tool. You hope that it's a tool that gives you the opportunity to really demonstrate, uh, you know, give you the maximum opportunity actually to, uh, to, to get the results. Um, you know, the cars that uh, you always uh, remember, the cars you fall in love with are the cars that uh, allow you to cross the finish line first. <laughs> you know, and uh, people ask me, you know, what are your favorite cars? Anyone that uh, brought me to victory. Um, no question. I remember even uh, one time as early as my very first 24 hour race. I uh, was at uh, 24 hours of Daytona in 1966. I was in a Ferrari with uh, my teammate Pedro Rodriguez, was uh, uh, the North American racing team effort, you know, Luigi Canetti. Canetti, yeah. And, uh, and the car was so consistent. And and of course, you know, a 24 hour race, two drivers, you get to do a lot of driving. And, uh, and I was loving because the first time that I had to, um, the opportunity to just do my stint and then go back and rethink. And I said, in about an hour and a half, I'm going back and I'm going to try to even improve, hit my marks. And I was falling in love with that car. I, I remember that as clearly as it is today only because it gave me back what I wanted and I uh, was responding. And it's the first time I had the opportunity to really do that and do it over and over, you know, for the duration of the race. And, and, and later on, I remember just even uh, leading races where, you know, the car would just do us, you know, uh, it's not often, but it's certain times when uh, you feel today they have to beat me unless this car lets me down. I mean, I got it. And it's the one, most wonderful feeling in the world for a driver. Uh, not often enough, but again, I've had it a few times and uh, I'm just, uh, uh, you know, just obviously lucky that I had those experiences. So I have just one more question before I start taking some questions from, from the crowd. Um, why do you think more drivers aren't versatile or more versatile today? Like, you know, you had John Surtees, world champion in cars and motorcycles you are champion in everything you drove pretty much uh is it because the ladder is not there in the same way or is it because it's so much more specialized well you can hide behind a lot of things obviously i think it's a personal thing quite honestly um because um uh, let's face it uh, you could be very happy by just having a career just specializing in one area you could specialize in sports car you could specialize in stock cars, you can specialize in rally, you can specialize in Formula One and Indy cars. Uh, however, uh, has to be a desire that's personal to be able to venture out because it's a lot of effort. It's a lot of effort and uh, is it important to you? Uh, a lot of uh, drivers, you know, if they're asked that question, well, my contract won't allow this and that. Well, I got news for you. Uh, every contract that I've had, because you always have a main contract, obviously you can't have, uh, because the season is uh, demanding in whichever category you're gonna go for a championship. And uh, every contract I ever had, starting you know, in 65, um, uh, for, you know, it, was, it forbade me from, uh, from doing anything else. And um, I was doing my own contracts, and uh, did I ever uh, negotiate that part? No, I just let it go. I figured I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, I say this, you know, I was uh, specifically when we were up for the championship and, uh, in, you know, in the Formula One, um, my contract specifically said, you, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're not to do anything else. So you, uh, you're breaching a contract. And uh, I was doing Indy cars in between. I was doing IROC. And um, I remember one time uh, after a test at Silverstone, <laughs> specifically, where, uh, and this was the only time Colin Chapman, you know, I says, what are you going to do this weekend? It's an open weekend. I said, well, I said, I'm racing uh, for uh, Roger Penske in Michigan and, uh, you know, an IndyCar race. He says, you can't do that. I said, I know. I said, but I will. You know, so it was that type of thing. So, uh, and I did that. I think, um, you know, I breached every one of my contracts, but what are you going to do? You know, fire you? It's, uh, it's that sort You're of Mario thing. You're Mario Andretti. They're not so, going to fire you. Well, no, if, uh, uh, let's face it, if uh, uh, Jeff Gordon wanted to go and, 
and do a Formula One race, uh, you know, is uh, uh, Mr. Hendrick going to go fire him? No, or anyone else for that matter. So uh, obviously you have to be a little bit in a position, you know, uh, to, to be able to do that. But, um, you know, the drivers that uh, usually uh, receive value in, in trying to venture into another category, you know, or have some status. So, um, again, um, uh, I don't buy that. So, it, but again, it's, I respect the fact that uh, it's, um, you know, it's everyone's life, everyone's career. And, um, and you know, you just uh, do whatever melts your butter, you know, and that's it. Okay, let's go to uh, some questions from the audience. Is, is there a meal you like to eat before a race uh, or a favorite meal in general? Not necessarily, but, uh, you know, I uh, always had a, a fairly light meal in the morning. I had, a, you know, a good meal in the, the night before, of course, the dinner, but uh, I always like to go, you know, with a, a fairly light stomach because uh, I, I, I think if you, if you have to have a, a you have to have go through digestion. I think it takes away from uh, being, you know, really sharp. So uh, I was always most comfortable with, with a fairly light meal, quite honestly, in the, the morning of the race. Um, how many cops have let you off or out of tickets once they got to the side of the car and they saw it was you in there? Uh, you know, uh, I'm a real friend of the, of, of the police, obviously, and uh, I know that they're doing their job and, and, and it's, it's absolutely uh, proper and needed. Uh, and uh, uh, I, you know, a few times I've been over the speed limit, of course, you know, but uh, I think what always saved me was the fact that uh, uh, I don't reckless drive. I don't, clearly, I don't and will not ever put anybody in jeopardy on the road, you know, to be stupid. And then I think that's what uh, uh, let me off usually, you know, um, and, um, and to say for those guys, you know, that, uh, you know, they're very reasonable, you know, usually they've been with me and, and so I have a clean record. Thank you. They never, they never came up to the clean car record. and said, did, 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 <laughs> did they ever come up to the window and say, who do you think you are, Mario Andretti? And then. It just happened one time, actually, when I wasn't even driving. Actually, it was uh, with Vince Granatelli in Santa Monica. He sort of blew through an intersection, and uh, he got pulled over. And there was a weekend of the Long Beach Grand Prix, and I was up there with him, and he was showing me off of one of those uh, supercharged Camaros, you know, with 17,000 horsepower. And uh, so, so anyway, I got pulled over, and, and then, so the officer said, and, uh, and, and then it started laughing and the officer said that, you know, I didn't think it was funny. And then he says, uh, well, he says, he's sitting right here with me. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> that was kind of interesting. I had to show him my okay, one, one more question. One more question before we're out of time. Um, are you binge watching anything right now? Am I what? Binge watching anything. Uh, not really. Uh, you know, I'm stuck in the news, you know, because, uh, I really want to know what's going on by the day because it's so important to be up to date. And uh, so that's where my nose is, you know, pretty much uh, because uh, everything else on TV is a repeat anyway. Uh, so again, I do that and, um, and, and I keep, I'm, I'm busy. I'm doing uh, interviews every day and then I'm doing actually, uh, believe it or not, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just doing my memoirs. Um, uh, let's see, uh, just to take advantage of the time, because I would never in, in, I don't know, in the foreseeable future ever give the time that's needed to reflect, to do that sort of thing. And uh, I'm doing it with a fantastic author, um, uh, David Fisher. Um, and, and he's helping me, you know, just really reflect and, and uh, put things in perspective. Um, so uh, I'm, taking the most advantage of the time that I have available. That's all there's to it. And, uh, and I think ultimately, um, you know, I'll be, I'll be happy with that, that uh, uh, I took advantage of the time, really. Well, we can't wait to read it. And uh, <laughs> God bless you, Mario. Thank you for doing this. It was such a treat, such an honor and a pleasure. Very, Thanks very for kind. your insight. Very kind, Eddie. Thank you for having me. All right. We'll see you soon. Thank you. And uh, as 
readers of Road and Track know, um, we are launching in the fall a special um, new, uh, I would say, venture as uh, R&T becomes the kind of fullest expression of the Road and Track brand for the super enthusiast, a real keepsake, beautiful art book. And membership to the, the new R&T includes experiences like the one we just had with Mario. So look for it in the fall. Um, there'll be ample, ample opportunities to subscribe and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks everyone.